The discovery of fire was, without a doubt, one of the biggest turning points in the evolution of human civilization. The ability to create and control fire allowed us to cook more food, make better hunting tools, and stay warm and cuddly during those cold nights. But only for the past 300 years have we been using heat to produce motion. The steam engine revolutionized the world and spawned the science of thermodynamics. This will be an introductory lesson into this complex but pretty interesting subject. My name is Wissam, and this is a lesson on thermodynamics. Learning some thermo. Everyone loves thermo. Yeah. Cars, planes, refrigerators, furnaces that heat our homes, steam turbines that generate our electricity, thermodynamics governs our world. So what is it? We can define it simply as the science of the relationship between heat and work. Work, 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 work. Work is a transfer of mechanical energy. It's basically a force times a distance. Here, the force I'm pushing is the weight of my buddy and the sled times the sliding friction coefficient between the sled and the turf. And the distance is simply the distance that I push him. In thermodynamics, we talk a lot about pressure volume work. For example, a gas applies pressure on a piston and moves it, thereby doing work on the piston. The piston can also do work on the gas. Other types of work are like electrical work or maybe shaft work. Here, the fan is doing work on the air via the kinetic energy of its blades. Heat, on the other hand, is simple. It's any energy transfer that doesn't involve work and it's driven by temperature differences. The first practical heat engines were developed late in the 17th century as a way to remove water from mines. Our ancestors had some pretty clever ways of doing this, but as they began to switch from wood to coal as their main source of fuel, they needed a way to more efficiently perform this process. Thus, in 1698, Thomas Savory built the first steam engine. Savory's engine basically worked like this. You boil water to make some steam. Then you condense that steam, which forms a vacuum in the container and pulls the water up from the ground. Here's a quick demonstration. I've got a bottle that's full of steam. When I cool the bottle, the steam condenses into water and leaves a vacuum where the steam was. This creates a pressure gradient between the inside and outside of the bottle, which forces the water into it. Savory's engine was really more of a pump, so a few years later, Thomas Newcomen expanded on his design. He slapped a piston on one side, a pump on the other, and a beam at the top, and voila, you've got a reciprocating engine. Then James Watt comes along and says, We want rotation! And several other ingenious things that he invented. And boom, the mechanical workhorse that we know as the steam engine was born. These engines sparked the Industrial Revolution. However, they were highly inefficient. There was no science behind their operations. Thermodynamics did not even exist. We needed to create some order. We needed to lay down the law. All right, next up is the case of temperature, pressure, and volume versus the state. You boys always seem to be uh, causing trouble together, don't you? How does the jury find the defendants? Your Honor, we, the jury, find the defendants guilty by association to one another through an equation, which uh, ideally we would have had a name for already. <laughs> Ideal gas law. Hey, 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 I get to name it. This is Smith. You're not even a real judge. The ideal gas law defines the relationship between the pressure, volume, temperature, and mass of a gas, and how these properties change between different states. The ideal gas law can help us predict how much work an engine can produce. It also explains why my cheap gas struts fail in the wintertime. Next, in the early 1820s, Sadi Carnot, considered the father of thermodynamics, began to lay down some of the principles of this new science. Carnot showed that an engine's efficiency is only a function of the temperatures between which it operates. Like a water wheel, he thought, an engine takes heat from a high temperature supply and passes it to a low temperature one. The larger this difference, the more work can be extracted. We'll get back to Carnot a little bit later. Then in 1843, James Joule changed the way that people understood heat and energy forever. Joule attached weights to one end of a rope and a paddle wheel to the other end, which was submerged in water. The energy from the falling weights spun the paddle and the friction that it created with the water heated the water up. He repeated this several times, measuring the water temperature before and after each run, and demonstrated that the heat produced in the water was equivalent to the energy released by the weights. 
This concept was groundbreaking. The accepted theory at that time was that heat was an invisible fluid called caloric that all materials contained. The fluid just traveled from one material to another, never being destroyed or created. But Joule proved that heat was actually created by transforming energy. In other words, heat was simply another form of energy. This led to the first law of thermodynamics. The change in energy in a system is equal to the heat supplied to that system minus the work done by it. In Joule's experiment with the tank as our system, work was done to it via the potential energy of the weights. The heat supplied was zero since the tank was insulated and the water's energy increased in the form of temperature. What the first law tells us is that heat and work are the same. We could have heated the water in a boiler and we would have gotten the same exact result. But the main thing that the first law tells us is that energy must be conserved. The total energy in a system will always remain the same unless that system is exchanging heat or work with its surroundings. If work is being done, like say in an engine, then the energy in that engine will be used up. And that energy has to be resupplied as either work or heat in order for it to keep running. In other words, a perpetual motion machine is, according to the first law, impossible. The first law is great. It's great. It's, it's great. It's, don't get me wrong. But it doesn't explain everything. Things like efficiencies, the quality of an energy, and the direction that a process can move in require another law to explain them. Can we run Joule's experiment in reverse, using the water's energy to spin the weights back up? The first law doesn't prohibit this, but the answer is no. The heat gained by the water cannot organize itself and spin the paddle in reverse. All the electrical energy of this fan eventually goes into heating the air. But this energy is degraded. It's not useful. It's not going to spin the fan and regenerate that electricity. It's crap, garbage. Every time energy is converted, there's some amount of energy that is no longer available to use. This is the concept of entropy. The total entropy in a process always increases and the entropy in the universe is always increasing over time. Thus, the second law defines the direction that a process is allowed to move in, and we can break it down to two statements. Heat naturally flows from hot to cold, and engines have to waste some heat. It seems silly to make a law saying that a cup of coffee will cool down if you leave it outside. But think about why this is important. If the coffee could take heat from the colder room and warm up, we'd solve a lot of our energy problems. The cold heat that much of our energy eventually becomes could then get reused. But obviously this never happens. Systems always naturally come to some equilibrium, which is a very unuseful state. And this is what the second law enforces. Engines work in this way, like we talked about. You pass heat from a hot source to a cold one and you spit out some work. But the second part of this law is interesting. Why do we have to waste heat? Why can't we convert all of our heat energy into mechanical energy? You've probably seen these giant towers before. These are cooling towers. They get rid of waste heat in power plants. In a steam turbine cycle, they work with the condenser to keep the condenser water nice and cool. The condenser removes the heat from the turbine exhaust steam before it gets sent back to the boiler. But why do we need this step? Why do we cool the steam if we're just going to heat it up again? Why can't we save all this heat and just put it back in our system? It's because your system wouldn't produce any work. An engine operates in a cycle. The gas goes through different stages and it tries to convert as much of the heat as it can into work. But this is only possible if you dump some heat along the way. If you try to reuse the exhaust heat, your system would look like this. The work you'd need to compress that hot gas would be enormous. All the work that you just extracted from your turbine would go right back into compressing that gas. So your net work would end up being zero. In order to gain some work from your system, you need to reduce the work that you put in or your pumping work. And you do this by cooling the gas as much as possible before compressing it. Turning the steam back into water makes our pumping work much, much less. It's much easier to pump a liquid than it is to compress a gas. Thus, there's a maximum efficiency to all heat engines. 
It was predicted by Carnot decades earlier and then later refined as 1 minus the ratio of the temperature of the heat sink to the temperature of the heat source. The hotter you can heat up your gas and the colder you exhaust it at, the more efficient your engine will be. So if the steam enters our turbine, say at 500 degrees Celsius and the condenser water is at 20 degrees Celsius, then its maximum efficiency will be around 62%. When you factor in friction, pressure loss, leaks, and other sources of losses, a steam turbine deficiency might be closer to around 40%. The second law of thermodynamics plays a pretty important role in our everyday lives, but it's not an easy law to grasp. The core reason that we can't save waste heat is because of the second law. The cold exhaust cannot flow back to the hot boiler. Heat doesn't travel that way, so we have to discard it. And hopefully I didn't make that overly complicated. The second law is one of many topics that would require its own separate lesson. But hopefully this was a good enough introduction and I managed to answer some of your guys' burning questions. Eh? <laughs> Thank you all for watching. My name is Wissam and I'll see you next time.